So hello. All right. Um, first of all, a few things. One, uh, thank you very much to Reganti for the invitation to come and speak. Um, hopefully this will be interesting enough for everybody. Um, Igor called me and said, yeah, come talk. Eh, we'll see how that goes. All right. So um, as Eva introduced, my name is Christopher Camargo. I've been a project manager for a very, very long time. Um, roughly 25 years. Um, currently, I work with Kindrel, and I currently lead project management for uh, Deutsche Bank. So I've got a lot of experience when it comes to implementing projects in big global organizations, um, but the disclaimer here is this is just my opinion, <laughs> um, experience that have happened to me not representing Kindrel or Deutsche Bank. But, let me give you a little bit of background into um, something that I think that will illustrate kind of the importance of agile, importance of um, communication involving your clients, and by not doing so, kind of the problems that will, you can anticipate in projects. So a little bit of background. Um, in most companies, in most organizations, there is a talent shortage. Right? There's not enough good people. The skills that you need are not there. Right? And there's tremendous competition. So what do you do? So there was a plan that we would use automation to address all three of these things. If you think about it, it's going to be really easy. It makes a lot of sense. What you'll do is you'll automate some workload typically some lower level skilled workload. Then you can take that person that you freed up, you can upskill them, teach them something new so they retain all of their inside knowledge, and then put them to higher billable work. So it's not that you're doing more with less, but you're doing more with the same. Keep the same amount of people, but everybody's elevated. All right, makes sense, right? You don't have retraining costs. You don't have to go out and recruit. Makes perfect sense. Then you run into the problem. Who gets upskilled? All right. Um, what's the time frame? All right. If you're going to take somebody who does change coordination, are you going to make them an IT architect? If you're going to take a service manager, are they going to become a client rep? Are they going to become a crisis manager? All right. If you take somebody who does incident management, do they become a project manager, All right? So this added some complications to things. But the solution was just deploy these 18 tools. You'll see all of your new capacity, and that's how you'll decide. That's how you move everything up. Okay. So the goal that I got was Implement new global automation tools, which will allow you to free up 100 people, upskill them all, redeploy them to more profitable work, and do it all in four months. So I got this project, and that night I had Slipovica because I figured <laughs> I'm going to need to get inspired here somehow. So that was the project. All right, a little bit of background and a little bit of challenges we have. My client is a regulated client, highly restricted. Right? Um, most of the tools which were created rely on bi-directional data transfers. The bank does not allow inbound traffic into their network for good reasons, right? But that's how the tools were designed, all right? Additional data privacy requirements uh, existed, all right? Some of these new tools used subcontractors in Romania, in Bulgaria, which the bank did not know about, so they had to vet all of these companies, all right? Um, we 
we're already a mature account when it came to terms of automation. All right? We've been doing it for a while. All right? Anybody familiar with the law of diminishing returns? What is it? Absolutely right, all right? What I've learned in my time in the Czech Republic, the best way to explain this is your beer. That first beer you have, let's face it, it's awesome. The second one is still pretty good. By the time you hit that sixth and seventh one, they may still be good, but it's never as good as that first one, all right? That's your law of diminishing returns. So you're absolutely right. There's the, the logarithmic scale, but I just put it in terms of beer, right? You keep adding more, you're not gonna get that same bang for your buck, all right? The other challenge I came across was that not all of the tooling was as production ready as advertised. Okay, wasn't quite ready for a rollout. So there were some elementary lessons that I've learned throughout my time dealing with this project, all right? And again, I think these are applicable really to whether you're putting in a, a network project, whether it's software development, um, really anything, all right? One, you have to know your client. You've got to know the customer, all right? We should have been considered by our own company as the client in this case, but we weren't. It was very top-down driven, all right? Um, had they realized we actually were the client, we would have given additional insight, things that probably wouldn't have been missed the first go round. okay? One size does not fit all. In most cases, one size doesn't even fit most. All right. And this applies to tooling. It also applies to any kind of metrics that you're going to use, any type of scorecard. Right? Um, when you have one size fits all, again, it becomes very prescriptive. Just do it and it's going to work. Okay. Any type of co-creation is going to take time. All right. When you're doing something new, it's gonna take time, all right? The challenge is, is when you're doing any type of co-creation, those developers are usually working on a lot of other things. And if you're the one-off, that means you're not the low-hanging fruit, which means you're not the priority. So usually, you know, you have that whole 80-20 rule. They want to get everybody else done first. Then we'll come back to you. Meanwhile, I'm the one there with all of the restrictions and all of the problems, and I'm not making any progress. All right? So you got to remember that things are going to take time. Okay? And quite often, people confuse, especially within scorecards, maturity levels. Within six months, you need to be ranked A2, or you need to be at the midpoint of automation, or you need to be a silver. None of these mean anything, all right? All of these maturity levels, all these are milestones that occur throughout your implementation journey, all right? But they're not the end result. All right, you being silver doesn't do anything, all right? That's not the intended goal, all right? In my case, the intended goal was roll out this automation, free people up so that you can upskill them all at the same time and redeploy, all right? Me reaching A2 level within three months meant nothing. Always involve the client. Anything you do, involve the client. You need the input, all right? 
Otherwise, you're making assumptions and you're going to get in trouble. Okay? The problem that I had in this case was that ideas were gathered at a very high level, requirements were set without my input, without my account's input, and then we were given something that we were told, here, go ahead and roll this out. It's a tool that will not function for us. Right. User stories. Who's familiar with user stories? See, now you have two friends. They're both familiar with you. All right, you're sitting in the right part. All right, so what are user stories? Anybody want to help me out? All right. For me, user stories are awesome, all right, because it's the voice of the client, all right? You find out from them what they really want, what it is that you need to do, all right? Um, include all of your stakeholders in the user stories. And this is something that I've seen uh, miss a few times, all right? They'll, people are gathering their requirements for their user story, and they'll talk to the director of IT, They'll talk to the crisis manager. They'll talk to everybody who's important. But then they forget the person who does all of the change implementation. And what he or she does makes a big difference in the workflow. But it gets overlooked, right? So your stakeholders are more than the execs or the um, people with the wallets, right? You need, you need to go after everybody who has skin in the game, right? So don't underestimate their value. Um, the cool thing about user stories, I find, is that it provides a holistic view of the landscape, right? It gives you a better understanding, and this is what you need anytime you're gonna do something new, all right? Better understanding of the workflow, all right? Understanding the landscape, um, again, this can be anything from how our system interacts with other systems, other tooling. It could also be the political landscape. It could be the mindset landscape, right? Quite often, people are resistant to change, right? Most people don't like change, right? But through the user stories, you're going to get a better sense of what's going on, right? Um, quite often, who do you need to win over? Right? And then you're going to use these to align the overall scope and then reflect the actual priorities, right? You're going to find out what's really important versus what somebody thought was important. All right. It helps you split the difference between the must-haves and, you know, be kind of cool to have. All right. uh, one of the things that has gotten me over the years is Agile. All right. Everybody loves Agile, right? This part where everybody cheers. Yes, everybody loves Agile. The problem is, is for most people, they don't know what Agile is. All right. Agile is the cool new thing that everybody needs to be involved with, all right? So what happens is people say Agile, but just because you call it Agile it does not mean it is Agile, all right? Um, if nobody's letting you in in the planning phase of the project that you need to deliver, it's not Agile, okay? Wanting to start quickly. We'll ignore the voice of the client. We know what they need. Let's just start. Then we can iterate if we get it wrong. That's just starting off wrong, all right? Um, what this leads to, this leads to situations where I've seen some DevOps programmers, where, I'd rather have it wrong than late. Because if it's wrong, that's okay, it's agile. That means we can reiterate, we can fix it, we can course correct, all right? It can be fixed later. 
To me, every time I hear this, okay, that means rework, normally around the clock rework, in order to get something done. Okay. Build an MVP, the minimal viable product. And again, I said it's the minimal viable product that actually works, right? It's actually what you want to deliver. It may not be perfect, but it's going in the right direction, right? So you release it, you test it, you find the sweet spot, and then you continue to improve it. Many times I've seen, yeah, minimal viable product. Yeah, just put anything out and then we'll fix it later. That does not mean you get to your, your minimal, vi it's not minimal viable crap, right? Just put something out and then we'll take it from there, right? It actually has to deliver something, all right? In many organizations, and again, my background is in big corporate global organizations. Even though executives hear agile, in their brain, that's waterfall. And it's very difficult to separate those things. Okay? So in agile, you're going to have sprints. We're going to work on something. What the exec hears is, oh, that sprint ends on this date, and that's when I'm going to get my product, and everything's going to work. And those are the deadlines that they have now committed to, and quite often those are tied to somebody's bonuses, which means you then you get things which are unrealistic and unachievable, or at least in the short time, in the short term, excuse me. All right. So... A lot of times, I, I spend a lot of time talking to people and, yes, we're agile. I want you to run this project agile. It's going to give us the, the most benefits, yes. And by the way, I need you to deploy this in four months, freeing up 100 people, and make everybody an IT architect all at the same time. That is not agile. So. This has been a quick, high-level view of what I've been spending the last 18 months of my life on. <laughs> I'm, yeah, it's interesting. But one of the things that I'm really happy about is that it's forced me to really go back and look at the lessons learned. All right? I cannot wait for my lessons learned on this one. All right. Um, but what I think is applicable to all project managers, right? And as Igor was saying, you know, here we want to kind of spread some of that project management knowledge across DevOps and things like that. Is again, you've got to know your client, it's your customers, but it's also it's the stakeholders. You cannot forget people along the way, right? Why do we need his opinion? He's not really involved. He processes 30% of your transactions. I bet you he's got some insight, All right? Um, why do you need compliance in their view? They'll get in the way because the woman in compliance knows all the ins and outs and the loopholes that you need to take into account in your rollout, all right? Do not forget the stakeholders, all right? You have to involve the client in user stories, all right? for the very points that I just made. You need to find all of the hidden details, right? I think you say it in Czech. I know in English we say the devil's in the details. Yeah, details, right? One size does not fit all, right? Does not fit most. Um, Quite often, one size sometimes barely fits any. Right. Things take time. What I found in most projects, especially if you have some development, especially if you're going to do something new, it's going to take longer than you thought it would. And knowing that, what do we do? we normally pad some extra time, right? Guess what, go back to the first rule, it's gonna take longer than you thought. 
So you got to pat it on some more. Okay. Um, again, th the things taking time, this rolls back to when you're dealing with culture, especially with executives, right? And I don't mean to pick on the executives, but they're not here, so I can, all right? When you get into the culture of agile, I need this quick, I need it fast, it's got to be good, it's got to be cheap, and make it agile. You're going to spend a lot of your time doing the project, and you're going to spend a lot of time holding people's hands and educating them. All right? So factor that in to all of your project plans, especially when we talked about things are going to take longer than you thought. All right. um, and again, mine is, you know, don't be agile in name only. All right. You actually have to practice it. All right. um, you need to do stand-ups. You need to have client stories. Um, you need to have sprints. You need to have iterative development. All right. You can't just say, we're now agile and things work better, right? It takes time. You need to build it into your culture. You need to build it into your DNA, all right? Um, it's like me taking check lessons, right? Yeah, an hour a week is not going to cut it, right? You're going to have to invest your time, right? Um, you're going to have to make lots of mistakes, right? I've made plenty of mistakes speaking Czech. Igor knows about a few of them, right? They tend to be, they tend to be funny, but um, again, you're going to learn from those mistakes. You're going to have your growing pains, right? And that's what's going to help you actually move forward with Agile. So that was, again, a little glimpse into the last almost year and a half of my life um, with this project. Um, does anybody have any questions or am I now off the hook? Yeah, please. Well, you know the good places. So what's your estimated age? <laughs> yeah. Um, Again, now which phase of it? The initial deploy these tools, free everybody up, retrain was supposed to be four months. We're almost at 18 months now. As far as all of the tooling, conservatively, I would say it'll be finished by July. Thank you. Yes. Uh, my question, uh, how do you fit uh, agile approach with classical corporate budget winning plan? <laughs> <laughs> that is a great question. Um, I wish I had a great answer for you. Um, I'm in a little bit of a better position in the fact that I used to be IBM, and part of IBM has spun off and become Kindrel. So I'm in that Kindrel boat, all right? which meant that splitting off, we've become basically the world's largest startup, which has allowed us to have a little more flexibility in terms of the budgeting and finance, which with IBM we never had. All right, so that has helped. The hard part is that most of our senior leaders and most of the systems we inherited came over from IBM, which were not flexible to begin with. So it, it, it's been tough. Um, quite often it involves a lot of yelling um, I say that in jest, but 
normally once I've hung up from my conference call and I've shut down my video call, then it's normally at me yelling at the wall. Um, why are we still going through this? Um, it's not easy. Um, most large organizations, especially those that answer to Wall Street, are very specific on when they're going to get their return on investment. You have more flexibility in smaller firms. All right. um, I unfortunately have never gotten the joy of being able to experience it on the smaller side. I've always been on the very big, large, inflexible side. So I don't have a great answer for you other than, yeah, for me, it's a lot of yelling. Thank you for all that. Yeah. Um, yeah, PCRs, so project change requests, um, but quite often when you're dealing with projects at a certain level, it's not so simple as just a PCR. At that point, that change request is really only done on paper. At that level, it's normally a phone call because you're talking to somebody normally at a vice president level or higher that has said, we will deliver this. There have been commitments made, there's expectations to Wall Street. Um, you're never gonna go to the New York Stock Exchange and say, but look, we had a PCR. We had a change request, so we get more money and more time. Um, so the mechanism is there, but it's fake. It, yeah. So. All right. Well, if that's it, hopefully this was at least somewhat interesting. <laughs> and uh, again, thank you very much for the invite. I appreciate it. And uh, okay, cool. I'm done. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.